joining us from the two conferences. I'm very pleased to welcome you to our keynote, our shared keynote for the Global Political Thought Conference, as well as for the graduate, uh, our graduate political theory conference. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome our two speakers, Mr. Balinokta, Dr. Mehta, welcome. Um, welcome back, rather, I should say. Um, and we are, just so everybody knows, this is a hybrid format that we're doing. It's been a little bit rough, um, but Hansel and Brenda will be taking you into the um, laptop in front of them in case you're wondering why they're swiveling that laptop around. Um, and uh, hand it over to my colleague. Thank you so much, Ian. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming, both our uh, graduate student uh, political theory conference that was happening in CJUS and also our global political thought project here. And thank you, everyone, and all the panelists who have very much inspired us along the way. And, uh, and all of your conversations and interlocutions uh, have become this uh, polygonum and this prologue to uh, the uh, keynote speech that's going to take place here at, at this moment. And I'm going to play uh, a very minor role, uh, a role that is perhaps somewhere in between a, a Confucian student uh, trying to elicit uh, the teachings from the master and, and between a, uh, an, an Socratic interlocutor right, who poses the puzzle or states the conventional opinion waiting for it to be rebuked. Uh, or, or, or indeed, a Shakespearean fool accidentally also slips out some, some partial truths uh, for the readers to, to interpret. Uh, so I would like to uh, begin by dumping a few questions at, uh, at Prata uh, on the theme of the decolonial moment. And then we hear in part two uh, Prata's uh, reflections on, on this problem. Uh, and in part three, uh, Ening is going to, to come back and steer our conversations between uh, the audience and, and Prata so that we have a collective uh, reasoning uh, session at, at the end. So let me start by uh, asking my generic questions about uh, the decolonial de moment. And of course, when we think about the moment, we think about a conception of time that was uh, brought out saliently in uh, the last panel. And when we think about time, we can have different uh, understandings of what kind of time it is. Uh, what kind of conceptual framework uh, it, are, are we talking about? In terms of being a moment, I could think of a dialectical opposition of two kinds of time that is epitomized, of course, in the Greek notion of the kairos, the opportune, critical, interesting uh, time that brings out the energies uh, of the human capacity, uh, or the chronos, that is the progression of time, uh, perhaps linearly, perhaps in multi-directional ways. But the interaction between the progression of time and the, the punctuation of time, or the kind of punctuated equilibrium, as, as our second, third generation uh, evolutionary biology, biological theorists have, have come to call it. Um, what is the kind of interaction between the two when we think about the decolonization? Uh, what is the, the linear or uh, not so linear genealogy of uh, intellectual, social, material, cultural, and economic history that is brought to this place where we start thinking about the decolonial moment? And when it becomes a moment congealed very much uh, into a kairos, uh, what does that mean for us in terms of uh, our perception of that time and our approach to that time? How do we live that moment? Uh, and this brings me to my second batch of questions uh, on the, the where and the who and the how and the what. And so uh, it's, it's a time, I guess, that it means something different for uh, different groups of people in terms of demographics, in terms of geographies. Uh, what is the decolonial time and the moment for, uh, for those different ages? who may do something to shape this moment. And we may think that the decolonial time is a time specifically for the decolonizing, but also we can think very broadly about uh, the productive and even critical sources of thinking from those we identify as the, the colonial, right? Uh, so uh, I guess I mean, in the past uh, one or two decades, political theory has approached this problem also in different ways. We have been mining for those resources from within what we sometimes call a Western canon. Right? We start thinking about Hobbes and the international theory within Hobbes. We start thinking Locke and, and treaties and Locke and empire. We start thinking about uh, and Rousseau's attitude toward uh, the, 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 the revolutions. And we start thinking also about uh, the, the very uh, inseparability 
uh, of uh, Western theory and the contents, the imperial expansions and and, uh, and in very expansions of the spaces of human uh, reason and political actions, right? So what is the relationship between these different layers of agency? Uh, we can have a colonial as a source of oppression or as, uh, as a reaction against that oppression. We can have people who are immersed in that experiences but who come out of the discontent of the, of the colonized as a kind of agent uh, in, uh, that is mediating between the two worlds. We can also have the more authentic, more indigenous voices from on the ground. But of course, we don't also want to, to, uh, to engage in some kind of fetishism with a, a curious sense of indigenous and saying that, you know, if you're uh, a thinker educated in the West, using Western categories of federation, confederation, separation of power, then of course we're not speaking indigenous languages. Uh, but we do also have more indigenous voices, and they can be also uh, used to, to think critically uh, about this present moment. So now, with the agency question uh, having been asked, I'd like to ask of you about the space for political actions. And what is actionable and what is not actionable? And that's very much the question that was being posed uh, in response to the academic papers and for what we can do alternatively. And I identified three arenas where we can possibly do something. Please let me know what you think uh, we should do. The first arena, of course, is in the enterprise of national strategies on the part of the former colonies to reshape the world order. Right? That is the, the interest of critical theories now. How do we remake the world order? But then the challenge there, it seems to me, is that there are so, only so many constitutional forms and political regime types that we can resort to, and it does not seem as if decades after we first voiced our, our, our fervent aspiration for decolonization, we have been quite uh, a, a, a capable of imagining alternative constitutional forms, alternative regime types. We're stuck with some quite antiquated forms of organizing ourselves into polities, into communities, and, and even with a multi-layered kind of society, with subspaces of politics, with some administrative zones, with some uh, uh, devolution of political power, it does not seem as if we're quite there in terms of a political imagination. The second realm is the political economic realm, which also came out in our previous panels. And there, uh, it, it seems to me that we not only fail to, as it was pointed out uh, in, in previous panel, to decolonize the economy in terms of uh, reducing the dependence of the, of the colonized economies, but also we face very drastically different problems these days. Uh, we have productive vanguards engaged in highly capital intensive, highly knowledge intensive kinds of economic productions within clusters that are dispersed across the world. So we, it's not just a simple dichotomy between the Silicon Valley and the, and the emerging markets, it's also cities in India, cities in China, and even uh, emerging trade hubs and, and technological hubs from within Africa, and the rest of the productive rear guards, even from within those countries. So we have a, a cross-sectorial kind of dichotomy of labor, and the nature of labor, of course, is changing very fast. Traditional ways of thinking about labor, syndicalism, uh, how do we do with Fordism, what do we do in terms of de-alienating uh, people's relationship with the work they do, do not seem to be catching up with the reality of the knowledge economy. So that's the second challenge. And the third challenge is that it does not seem as if we can even take political actions anymore. Right? The traditional arenas of politics, whether it is uh, the, the stages on which we debate in the Athenian Assembly or if it is the, uh, the representative democracy and parliamentary democracy uh, that channel our, our political energies, uh, do not seem to be, to be either responsive or effectual in terms of uh, bringing out uh, transformative politics, right? Uh, well, transformative politics is always dependent on crisis, and we do something and during the crisis, but even with our crisis, there are many crises happening on a daily basis, we do not seem to be transforming ourselves in response to those crises, and we don't even imagine that without crisis we can think anything alternatively about <laughs> what we should do. 
So one response, of course, as we talked about before, is that uh, we can retreat into the inner self. And uh, now that the only kind of political decision we can make and assert and then effectuate is to reshape our identity. And of course, there are vibrant debates over identity politics in various ways that it has been defined as a term. But it does seem to be the case that we have increasingly uh, uh, reduced the space for politics and we're now shrinking into an increasingly smaller uh, kind of space for politics. So those are the three arenas where I thought that political action could take place, but I don't see it taking place. Right, so my question went from uh, <laughs> what, what the moment is, what kind of time it is, and what it means for whom, and where, and how, and since when. Uh, and now to what can we do, and what is, when, if you see these arenas as can be, maybe we can rejuvenate some kind of political energies, but I, I don't see how and, and, and what. So please enlighten us uh, with the answer. Thank you. wonderful opportunity and I think your question was alone worth this conference. Uh, uh, I mean I can just imagine Hegel sitting here and kind of you know trying to put all of this together. Um, so I guess maybe I'll try and do two things in the next few minutes and, and try and do it briefly because answer of the invitation was let's make it as participative as possible uh, and reflect on you know, many of the themes that came up during the day. And I'll begin with where you ended, which is the question of politics. Uh, now, I think one way of thinking about the dilemma, and I'll be simplistic for the for reasons of time, is what are the conditions of possibility for politics to happen? And when you think of something as political, the first assumption we make is for something to be political is for that thing or action to be not dictated by necessity. In some, in some senses, that's the old Greek idea of politics, right? When you're in the realm of necessity, you're not in the realm of the political in some senses, right? Political is agents consciously making and remaking their worlds together, right? Now, I think the interesting question for our times is, what are the sites where that conception of po politics actually is possible? And I mean, Michael Sandel is here, we've talked about this before. I think one of the interesting paradoxes of this moment right, is if you look at two traditions, the French, Re French Revolution, the revolutionary tradition, but also the anti-colonial tradition, right, and all its ramifications, you know, Fanon, Gandhi, the one thing all of them had in common was this idea that under conditions of modernity, whether it's post-colonialism, after colonialism, whether it's kind of post-revolutionary, are collective arrangements, right? the forms of collective institutionalized that we, uh, institutions that we inhabit, will be the subject of politics. Right? What form of politics we can debate but that's the site at which citizens, national publics, come together to make and remake their social world based on some conceptions of justice or some shared sort of moral ideas. Right? One of the interesting things that has, I think, happened at Arkin Juncture is that we have much more readily accepted the idea that what used to be areas that we used to think were governed by necessity, namely the dictates of nature, the natural world itself, is actually subject to radical remaking. We re-engineer the planet radically, we are re-engineering our genes, we can re-engineer ourselves in all kinds of interesting ways, right? So that's one area where there's a lot of remaking happening. There's a second area where there's a lot of remaking happening, which is and, and I think this goes to your question of identity politics, why identity politics is so important in this moment, where 
there was a set of categories through which we defined ourselves. And again, we simplistic, you know, think of gender, you think of caste, you think of race, which were given naturalized formations under conditions of modernity. These are just, you know, cultural essences. These are, you know, and what made them, in a sense, people. Right? Mm. And one area where we had a lot of success is, in a sense, denaturalizing those categories that the terms in which we now express ourselves are actually products of our self-definition. They're not products of objective classifications that can be validated as if they were corresponding to some natural scheme, right? And it's not an accident that this is the area where actually most of our politics is concentrated, uh, in some senses. But that third and most vital arena of modernity, right, which is the anti-colonial tradition, the revolutionary tradition, which is what are the two political forms that have acquired a quasi-naturalized status for us, the nation state and capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's incredible almost every argument we make about either the capitalism or nation state form ends somewhere with a gesture, these are necessary, right? right? And once you declare them to be necessary in some sense, by some logic, right? technocratic logic of economic efficiency or some other logic. At one level, you are actually taking them out of the realm of politics as the promise of politics are understood actually by right? them. So when people say about, you know, why is that more identity politics, can't we return to class politics? Uh, to me, one, of course, there is a lot of identity politics that, that is actually quite necessary, quite important for the reasons I just outlined. But another level, it is actually, I think, a symptom of this predicament. That these are the only sites where we actually think politics in that very crude sense of overcoming necessity or our necessary identities right, is actually possible. Now, if you take this view of politics, then I think it, it actually begins to make some sense of, I think, where we are in this decolonial moment. And, 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 and just to kind of. <laughs> You, you threw out lots of interesting conceptions of time from Greek to Shakespearean. Uh, so let me be very schematic, I think, when we think of particularly decolonial and political theory. Uh, so one, of course, is a very parochial and academic meaning of decolonial, which is what we fight over, and which is, I think this conference is, I think, a, a symptom of a kind of valiant battle in that, end, which is, uh, and I say this with full fidelity to my subfield. Um, political theory is basically a subfield that you can constitute it by about 15 books, right? <laughs> Maybe 15 might be a too generous number if you start to probe it, bit, right? Others are variations in that theme. It's a, you know, and, and that's its beauty. I think, I, think, I think there's something nicely eternal about political theory in that sense that you know, we actually still unflinchingly pick up Plato as if he were a, you know, a contemporary. Actually, I think there's something special about a conception of time in our field, in a way which is, drives historians crazy. <laughs> but, but that's OK. That's, that's, you know, that, that's a, uh, but one of the hazards in that field, in some senses, right, and, and, and one of the implications, uh, particularly post Hegel, was this idea that uh, what is important to read, uh, or what constitutes important forms of human reflection on our collective life uh, are largely, in a sense, located in the West. I mean, it was literally almost, it actually doesn't matter at some point what China and India think, or Africa thinks, or Latin America thinks in some ways. And at, in a very parochial sense, I think we're still living the aftermath of that, I think, construction. Uh, it's, 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 it's still not easily translated into academic and institutional practices. You just have to look at philosophy departments, the score below or what constitutes, I mean, it's astonishing to me that in 2021 20, we can still have this debate, right? Uh, the, the, you know, um, so that's the first concern to start off with de de decolonizing political theory. And, and, and I have to stress, I'm, I'm completely committed to that canon of 15, 20 books. I actually think the field is better off for it. So decolonizing can't, in some senses, mean replacement, but it, in some senses, it, it has to kind of enlarge the dialogue. That's a one parochial concern. Right? The second thing that was very productive, and I think 
this university has been actually a pretty good example in terms of the scholarship that it produced, particularly if you look at all the works on political theory and empire, you know, uh, Jennifer Pitts, Shankar Muttu, Karuna Mantena, sort of all kind of products of the department here, was to, in a sense, reread the canon of Western political theory in a very different context and to look at the ways in which actually empire shaped the understanding of very fundamental concepts. Sovereignty, liberty, property, you know, whatever. And and actually, by and large, it made the canon more interesting rather than less. When people think of it as a kind of debunking exercise, um, actually, it makes both the conceptual, I think, you know, fluidity, the conceptual kind of, I think, the interest of that canon much more powerful. And I think that work has been accomplished, I think, you know, brilliantly, I think, in, 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 in some ways. And we saw lots of examples today. Uh, I think of that kind of thing. Then there's this kind of third moment in some senses, which I think you might characterize as a kind of more in post-colonial theory, and I've again been quite productive about it, which in part further this enterprise of reading the Western canon against it to explain. It tried to come up with innovative ways of thinking about the question, given that political theory, history is in a sense written by dominant classes. Can you read those texts against the brain to actually recover articulations that might be submerged under them, right? Because in a sense, we've lost traces of them. And to that extent, I think a lot of post-colonial theory, at least in its basic impulse, actually did a lot of good, right? But post-colonial theory was, again, I think, caught in a predicament, which is that its focus was largely colonialism. Uh, it could answer the question sort of what after colonialism. Uh, its focus was largely the Western Academy, and I think in its institutional locations and formations, it actually depleted capacity elsewhere in some ways, uh, in terms of what we would actually think about, you know, how, how we actually think about uh, the enterprise of this dialogue. But all of these three strands were still very much focused on the question of empire colony. Now, to me, what was distinctive about anti-colonial movements, right? We saw some examples today. Even Nairere, I think, is problematic in some ways. But, but I think the underlying aspiration, or whether you, whether you think of sort of the Gandhi, Nehru, kind of Sukarno movement, is the anti-colonial movements were very much tied, as I said, to that modern project of thinking of a politics that, in a sense, frees us from the imperatives of these necessary identities. Right? In part, they had to do it because, remember, what was the colonizer's construction of the rest of the world? We have reason, you have culture. Right? We have universality, you have essence. Essence is precisely that you know, hostage, making you hostage to necessity. You are a script we can read off. Unfortunately, I think what post-colonial theory did was it simply replaced culture with the form of colonization. And so now we are simply products of the colonial experience we had. It's a kind of catch-all script which over-determines pretty much everything that happens in the colonies, right? And there was this moment, I mean, you, you can kind of date, you know, might date it differently, maybe post-World War, you know, to the 1950s, 1960s, where the world seems full of so many immense possibilities, right? Different forms of political organization, the debate between the left and right on forms of economic organization. Uh, the thing that Sandeep mentioned, I mean, it, it's hard for us to believe how seriously concepts of federation, world state, the de-territorial de imagination, kind of after independence in some senses, were actually debated at least. Uh, uh, even if they did ultimately get, get that kind of political traction, right? And I think to me, what's I think interesting about this moment is for all our talk of decolonization, uh, I think that kind of political imagination is, I think, more or less, I think, absent in our horizons, with one exception. The one exception has to, in a sense, be to ask the question who right now in the world order? claims to be carrying the mantle of decolonization. Mm -hmm. The answers you get is Mr. Putin, Mr. Xi, Mr. Modi, mm -hmm. Mr. Erdogan, yeah. 
Now there's a cautionary tale in this. The cautionary tale is, one, how easily they have appropriated the decolonial aspiration. Mm -hmm. And they use the word decolonial consistently. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not just kind of by inference. Uh, one of the best-selling books in India last year is a, is a book by a BJP thinker, J. Sai Deepak, which is entirely in a sense about decolonial. Right? What are the ingredients of this decolonial movement? we will destabilize Western hegemony and the first priority of decolonialism is actually destabilizing it. Everything else is in a sense secondary to it. Human rights, Ukrainian lives, Yemeni lives, that's a whole second order, right? Okay. There's a second conception at work here, which is without saying it explicitly, or the Putin says it explicitly, there is a understanding, although they all speak the language of sovereignty and you know, because it's quite strategically convenient, there is a attempt to in some senses destabilize the Westphalian UN system in some senses as we know it. They are all talking about zones of influence, let's recreate the Middle Kingdom, let's recreate Greater Russia, let's create in a sense greater Hindu civilization, Neo-Ottomanism, Ottomanism. I mean, these are serious decolonial political categories. Uh, but what's interesting about them is that on the three questions that you posed and they proposed in the last question, which is, do you have, do you think of the economy as a site of creating some kind of new and invented order, right? That's not just generally decolonial internationally, right? Uh, but in some senses domestically as well. Let's put it this way, they are completely instrumental and strategic. They can be a left, they can be a right, whatever works, right? Uh, on the question of technology, right? In a sense, will technology be subject to some kind of collective political control, right? Which is ethically mediated? Or is it now a kind of autonomous fate accompanying its own right to which you adapt? And you say, look, the only way in which you can decolonize is to ride this technology. Uh, so that's the third move is, and this is a nice reversal, that the West was accused of, in a sense, essentializing the rest, right? That's how it confined it to the dictates of necessity, hierarchy, you know, your own culture. Mm. But the reverse response to the West is doing exactly the same, right? Democracy is not something that emerges on this view out of the organic needs of you know, dealing with difference, dealing with dissent, maintaining the peace, right? a shared human condition. Right? It's, it's a Western essence expressed in kind of cultural form, right? which is why it's so easy, I mean, even for somebody as sophisticated as Mao, right, to actually say, look, that's not an option, because that's not Chinese. Uh, the call in India now, in a sense, to recreate a dharmic civilization, whatever that means. We talk, all the dharmic actually means is demographic dominance um, and prejudice against minorities. But right, the resonance of, in some sense, is that language that what we have, in a sense, inherited is a script from the West which we in some senses need to push back against. But without that underlying sense of politics in the old way which you talked about, right, post-French revolution stuff, all it becomes is a kind of gesture, right, where you say, where can I assert my politics, right? Who can I beat up, roughly speaking? That's, that's how, what it kind of translates to. Because that's the only place where I can say to myself, I'm free of the dictates of that necessity. Right? So, to me, I think the, the, the interesting question, I'm, I'm putting it simplistically and poetically, which is, A, is decolonization even possible? B, should we even be talking about it anymore? Right? Or should we, in a sense, return to the world that Navarte was actually, you know, that was articulated very well in that panel, right? Where, you know, he goes and sees a bunch of kings and says, hey, this is a common predicament. You have monarchs, we have monarchs. Right? You have a succession problem, we have a succession problem. Uh, he did not start off with the presumption of income and 
Right? What was interesting about that paper was exactly that, right? that I'm a Christian, you're a Confucian. He saw monarch to monarch, there's a bridge. Right? How do we create? Uh, you know, Alistair McIntyre has this nice phrase that you know, the best readings are a second first reading of a text. And maybe instead of going through all this kind of apparatus, we've, we've sort of exhausted it, post-colonial theory, deconstructing the text, we actually now need to return to a kind of naive second first reading of what our common political predicament uh, as a single planet is. Sorry for a long answer, but <laughs> you know. So one is you start off with, we are different national traditions, we are different groups, and we see commonalities in some senses with struggles elsewhere, you know, caste and race, on whatever axis you want to kind of organize them, right? Uh, and there is something to that in some sense, you know, I, I think it's it's both analytically and, and, and politically, you know, in a sense productive. But I think on this one analytical point and one moral point in some sense, I think so. So the analytical point is given that what we've experienced for, in a sense, so much of the you know, 19th, 20th century, right, seems to take similar forms, even if it, there are variations, local variations inflected by particular histories, uh, across the world simultaneously. I mean, you know. Charlie May wrote, for example, about the age of territoriality, right? There's a kind of global phenomenon in some senses. When we are now talking about populism as a global phenomenon in some senses, again, with, uh, again, interesting local variations, social basis, but the broad contours, right, seem similar, right? Uh, when we are talking about this reintroduction of a discourse of civilizational states, simultaneously in different geographies, the one obvious conclusion to draw from that is that you're not going to be able to get a handle on what form of solidarity is required is if, you, if your starting point is to actually think of these as, in a sense, discrete problems to begin with. Right? Uh, so that's, in a sense, the first kind of, I think, in a sense, kind of, you know, in a sense, analytical point. It's something the old left actually used to know. I mean, you know, socialism in one country was in a sense a, a manifestation of that. You, you're not going to be able to solve the problem in some sense of alternative economic imagination unless this is tied to some kind of global dialogue. Now, the modus vivendi we created, we said, like, in order to be able to do, to create that power to have that dialogue, you first need to be able to reach a stage, right, where somebody actually listens to you. And reaching that stage will actually require using precisely those old forms. Let's first get the nation state. Let's first get our capitals right. Let's first get the technology. Then the West might come to us talking about it. 
Um, and arguably we are in a sense at that stage at one level. And I think that's something that came out in the panels that you know, the relations that the West can have now I think in the sense with India and China, of course not the kinds of relations we have in the 19th century. So now the interesting question is can we again actually think in those global terms again? Uh, I think the moral point in the sense is in a sense the Gandhian one, right? Which is uh, one of the distinctive marks of anti-global movements in the turn of the century, I can speak of the Indian experience, but I think it's true elsewhere, is its resolute insistence on three things. One, that the colonizer themselves were as much under the sway of a form of necessity right, as the colonized. Uh, so in a sense, colonialism is not just a bunch of Englishmen deciding, you know, in a, in a kind of idealistic way. It is a product of some kind of deep contradiction of fissure within modernity. Right? Uh, it made the political task difficult because, you know, the critics said, look, basically what you're doing is in a sense soft peddling uh, the political decisions that are actually going to be making you know, colonialism. But, but Gandhi's basic kind of instinct that look, you, you can still have English food without Englishmen. Englishmen are totally peripheral to actually, in some senses, what we are experiencing, right? Uh, but it was important, I think, for them to do that because the one thing, it's something I'm writing, it's a, maybe it's a, it's a parochial obsession, but the extreme lengths to which somebody like Gandhi, Tagore, or Nehru go to say that whatever else the anti colonial movement might it should not manifest a politics of resentment. Mm. I mean, you know, quite, and, and it was quite a striking intellectual and political achievement. I mean, I, sometimes my students joke that actually post-colonial theory has more resentment in it than anti-colonial movements did. Uh, and, and, and I think for a good reason, because post-colonial theory is a product of a moment of a kind of intellectual, moral, and political dead end, right? Uh, uh, Whereas anti-colonial movements, in some senses, were actually forging a new political vocabulary. I mean, think of the innovation they did, right? Um, we talked about political parties this morning. Uh, think of the creation of the Communist Party, or even the Communist Party, actually, for that matter, as the innovation around a political form, right? Which actually then generated its own theory, and something that's still not been actually theorized in the formal structures of the way we actually think about it. You know, so you know, parties in some senses, right? Uh, so, in some ways, I think it's actually a return to that that form of anti-colonialism, right? which both can see the fact of domination, but actually doesn't walk away from the shared condition, saying the answer to an essentialism must, in a sense, be another essential. Which is actually, ironically, I think the interesting question to ask is why that tendency has deepened now. You know, you would have thought that nationalism of that essentialist kind, right, would actually have weakened, but it's 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 coming back, I think, much more strongly. Mm. My name is Kanchi Kandi. I'm from Bayar department. Both of you spoke very eloquently. And my question to you is, in spite of this word, decolonial, anti-colonial, my belief, since I came from India, my belief is, unless the basic necessity of common man is met, so now the common man, the, all these concepts may not, may be totally irrelevant. For example, in late 1860, probably you may remember that there was cement, great yeah. cement in yeah. 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 And that led the East India Company to sell tea in U.S. That led to the Boston Tea Party. Mm -hmm. And again, in ni late 1960, 100 years later, mm -hmm. there was a kind of famine in India due to rainfall failure. And that made Mrs. Gandhi to ask help from Lyndon Johnson mm -hmm. for the victim. So for common man in India, again, these wording didn't, didn't matter at all. So uh, my question to you is, do these things, these wordings, do they matter, these concepts, as long as the common man is able to have the basic 
made like recently mm -hmm. the law costing to President Prime Minister Modi about climate change. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Modi made it very clear he will keep burning coal because most people in India do not have electricity. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very powerful um, observation, and, and, and you know, I think, I think, I think, I mean, central to that aspiration, right? I mean, whether it was Nairari, Nairari or, or, or Nehru in some ways, uh, the promise of that modernity was exactly that: that unless you have, in a sense, a material base for a dignified life, uh, uh, it's not that the other rights don't matter. I mean, I, I actually don't buy this proposition that civil liberties don't matter. Mm. To the poor, I, I actually think that that I think is a fallacious. I think, I, I, I think in a sense inference, right? But if you go to the core of the question, what is it that makes for empowered political agents, and whether part of being an empowered political agent is having some modicum of control um, over the economic circumstances of your life? Uh, I mean, I think as an analytic proposition, that it's hard for me to imagine why anybody would, in some senses, disagree with that. I think the interesting question, the harder question, uh, which again came up in the previous panel, was why it is that in almost all our countries during the course of their decolonial projects, politics took a form in which either this question became much more peripheral. It was not the main organizing axis around which, in some senses, politics was conducted. It, it, I mean, it never goes away in democracy. It's, it's, it's there, and, and in many ways, much progress has been made. I, mean, you know, I, I would not underestimate uh, the achievement in lifting tens of millions of people out of poverty that has taken place in India and China in the last 25, 30 years. And I, 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 I honestly, I, I, I think it'd be, uh, I think, grotesque to actually underestimate what an achievement that is. But it is also true that our politics has not been centrally organized. Uh, uh, to, add, to address those questions, and going back to the question of temporality, that that's precisely the kind of aspiration for dignified life that has been consistently sacrificed to some potential future gain. I mean, that's the, so, so democracies, you know, they're often accused of being very presentist. But actually, in some senses, democracies are not presentist enough, right? If you actually look at it from a distribution dimension, right? Uh, which is, why is it that this argument from necessity, right? Don't raise the question of economic justice at all. Because in some senses, it will complicate the necessary development of the kinds of economic relations that we need for some potential future uh, uh, glory. So, so you have the tension between two kinds of temper, but I, I think your question is, you know, is, is exactly the right one. I'd like to go back, Chris Hopp, to the paradox of which we began. And you've written a brilliant essay about this in the aftermath of the pandemic, where you uh, speak to the paradox of our denaturalizing nature genetic engineering, and free technology, and at the same time, naturalizing artifice, mm -hmm. the things we've made by attributing necessity to social and economic arrangements, and neoliberal capitalism in particular. So I think this is, a, this is an enormously important paradox, and I wanted to ask you, how you account for it. Mm -hmm. And there are at least a couple of ways yeah. of accounting for it. That I can hear. Yeah. One of them was, uh, was suggested to me once in a class on the ethics of new technology yeah. and genetic engineering. Um, a colleague uh, whom I was teaching it with, and I invited in James Watson yeah. to talk about genetic engineering. And he was making the case for the genetic enhancement of intelligence and IQ, saying that people with below average IQ suffer terribly, they don't have good jobs, they're not well paid, there are all sorts of welfare dependencies, and so he wanted to improve them. And a student asked him a question. Uh, why is it 
that the way we should yeah. deal with that problem is by genetically re-engineering the vehicle rather than by changing the economy and the society mm -hmm. to avoid mm -hmm. that, uh, the, the effect mm -hmm. of this distribution of mm -hmm. IQ, whatever that means. And Watson's answer, which struck me, and which I found chilly, mm -hmm. was, well, what? You're never going to be able to change the, the economy and the society. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> That's why I want to, to, to engineer for yeah. genetics. Yeah. That's yeah. the only way we're going to solve, yeah. possibly solve the problem. <laughs> and that mm -hmm. made me wonder, going back to a compliment for the paradox yeah. that you highlight, is the aspiration of technology yeah. to remake our nature to engage in genetic re-engineering is this impulse compensatory for the loss of agency, loss of political agency? Or is the loss of political agency symptomatic of a spurious scientism represented by technology and especially economics backed by power and interest. Okay. Uh, <laughs> there's nothing to say after that. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, I think two things. I mean, one, to make the problem a little bit harder for us. Uh, <laughs> I'm kind of tempted to invoke I think Charles Taylor uh, on, on the first part of your question in some ways, which is that it is the case that in some sense if you think of paradigmatic accounts of modernity in the modern sources of the self, right? Uh, the sense of making our condition better in some ways and accompanying it the sense of the mastery over nature as so deep and profound, expressing something creative and profound about us. That's what makes it harder, that it's not just yeah. kind of pure evil. It's, right. it's in a sense an expression of a certain form of creativity, it's an expression of, uh, uh, the, that impulse has actually been very strong. And in some senses, what gives the technology stuff a bit of edge is its ability to align itself with, in a sense, that kind of humanitarian creative impulse. So typically, scientists will, in a sense, to respond to this will often say, but surely you want disease cure. Surely you want, you know, and, and this is just a kind of seamless extension of that in some ways. And to that extent, limiting this, containing this, not overturning this, I mean, I, 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 I don't think any of us are in a kind of position for having would actually have to involve reevaluating, in a sense, that deeper metaphysical kind of impulse where we actually think of this kind of, and, and, and the association of technology with play is quite profound in our culture in some ways, in all our cultures now globally. Right? Um, now, so, so that's what makes the problem, in a sense, harder, that it just doesn't kind of, it, I mean, I don't think it's just a cynical problem. That says, look, this is just an easy solution. Uh, technology is just available in hands. Let's, let's play around. And the second part, which is, in a sense, is this symptomatic of a loss of political agency, uh, or in some sense, as a, you know, acts as a kind of substitute, uh, I think, you know, I think, you know, I think for it. Uh, I think a little bit of cynicism is warranted, uh, which is to say that this is a form of promise for our collective enhancement, our collective betterment, at least in this kind of official story, uh, that actually doesn't have to speak the, the language of common good and sacrifice. That, 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 that is, as you have, in a sense, often pointed out. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's this fantasy of a kind of pretty optimal world, in some senses. It can actually make everybody better off without requiring any redistribution. Uh, and I think it's a very tempting 
actually idea, both politically, of course, it's very tempting. Uh, but actually, morally, it's also quite tempting, which is that if it were indeed the case, right, that you could actually use simply the application of technology right, to actually get everybody to the place you wanted us to be, it actually doesn't require the hard labor of reciprocity. It actually, and certainly doesn't require significant distribu distribution or redistribution of any kind. Uh, who wouldn't be attracted by it in some senses of the idea, right? So at one level, I think the, the, to me the interesting question is in some sense, what is it that then makes this kind of argument our default common sense? That we actually still find it plausible, uh, 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 you know, in, 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 you know in, in, in some ways. But as I said, I, I, I'm increasingly more attracted to a little bit of that cynical side that it is it it actually does suit the interest of a kind of competitive system uh, to say that we can there is a way in which we can be all made better off uh, that does not involve holding our ethical and political relationships to each other in some framework of accountability. phrase, which is a wonderful phrase, kind of ways of world making, <laughs> in some senses remaking it, uh, uh, I think. So let's ask the question, what are the difficulties that project runs into when we think of it as a political project? Uh, the first difficulty it immediately runs into, and this is again not an easy one, I actually you can see it in the Ukraine crisis as well, actually, if you want a very vivid illustration of this, which is There is a kind of, there are sort of limits to our attention in some ways. And there are limits to the ways in which we espouse causes that are suitable candidates for redress and through justice. Now, one of the challenges, I think, of a, of a world-making project is that it actually requires us to think of justice, in some senses, simultaneously for all those who are actually marginalized. Now, what happens in our politics effectively, right? And, and why, you know, just to the Ukraine crisis, the minute you put up Ukraine, the rest of the world is saying, oh, what about Yemen, right? That's, in a sense, the first response. And now, you know, we can argue about the ethics of that response and, you know, the sort of fair response. And, but what it does suggest to me is that if you're going to make the project a world making, you will have to do it from locations and standpoints that can actually convince people that these are not themselves weapons of particular partial, or, or, or let's put it this way, this is not itself weaponized for recreating, in a sense, another hierarchy of privilege and victimhood. Right? And that, it turns out, is politically an extremely hard thing to do. Uh, Maybe there's a metaphysical reason for this. I mean, William James's great essay that we are all partial beings, finite beings, uh, even when we are, in a sense, thinking of the range of injustices that 
can occupy our mind at any given moment. We will always pick out a limited subset, uh, which is perfectly fine from the point of view of the person who's trying to address that injustice. But from the point of view of the rest of the world, who you actually want to be a party in this project of world making, all it does in a sense is, is, is reinforce their skepticism and, then set, and their sense that this is in a sense all about kind of hypocrisy uh, in, you know, in some ways. Uh, and that, I think, is a, is, is, a, is, is a serious, I think, political problem in some ways, that you know, the only currency in which we seem to be able to pay attention to justice is if it comes in the forms of specific claims and the political power behind those specific claims. Uh, so I think that's the political problem we have to solve for a few weeks. Uh, I think the second, I think, challenge, and, and, and this is, I, I'm not sure what the answer to this one is, you know, given the limitations of what happened last time around, the, the Nerere experiment, the sort of, you know, uh, mixed economy experiment, the experiment with all kinds of, you know, regulations and stuff, uh, given the realities of global geostrategic power, uh, I think there's two things pretty much everybody is convinced of. Uh, Aaron's point, if you don't have citizenship rights and you don't have a nation state, it's very hard to think of how else we would actually make a rights paper out of the post. And unfortunately, I think, uh, the other conclusion everybody's going to now draw is that if you don't have nuclear weapons, uh, nobody's actually going to come to your, uh, you know, in some senses, uh, you know, uh, depend. So, you would have to have a pretty high threshold of kind of simultaneous mobilization across the world to kind of get over the hump where this doesn't seem either just a kind of academic exercise or, or it's just kind of fraught with just a form of hypocrisy, right? Uh, now, hypocrisy is not a good basis for public policy, uh, Jewish car used to remind us, but it is the pervasive reality and currency in which our politics play. dignity, liberty, equality, which are there in our fundamental rights chapter, and which are there in the constitutions of countries across the world, actually come from like um, Kantian enlightenment based thought. It's very individual based, doesn't account for community based cultures like the ones we have in India. And even the critique of institutions like say polygamy and imposing monogamy as a way of life and those kind of things um, are also in a sense driven by the whole idea that the like monogamy is like whiteness. Like, you know, it's a very Christian like idea that like even the Americans try to like kind of impose this over here in the context of the Mormons saying that if you're gonna marry more than one woman, that's a very like non-white barbaric thing to do and I think there's an impulse in these cases to like decolonize by saying that well that's not how our community perceives it and we don't want to take your vision of gender equality or justice as governing but then the problem is as you pointed out that risk going back to kind of regressing into what used to take place like sticking to tradition even if it's unfair and that's not a good solution either, so I wonder then how do you get out of that? <laughs> <laughs> Liberty, equality, dignity is a Western concept. 
you know, I, I, I completely agree. Um, a, that's just <laughs> historically not true. And, and by that I mean that it's not that the history of the West, in some sense, is an unremitting history of the kind of elaboration of these concepts. The individualism, collectivism contrast I also find completely baffling after all nationalism is one of the most extraordinary forms of collectivism any society has ever invented. So I, I actually, frankly, at that level, uh, but more seriously, more seriously, because this is a conversation we really can take, which is the way to think about liberty equality is not sort of, you know, Kant came up with the idea and somehow the rest of the world is following. A, this is just terrible history. That's even worse intellectual history. But it's also, in a sense, bad philosophy because what it does is kind of it severs those concepts, form a kind of organic situation of human relations from which they arise. Right? So I, I just give a very small anecdote. I mean, I, I remember once in India, a group of having a discussion with members of parliament from different parties. You know, some from the BJP, others, and you know, everybody was kind of. There seems to be consensus about freedom of speech is a Western concept, right? Okay. And the conversation went on for an hour. And it also, by the way, stretched you to all of these territories, you know, should women be allowed temples, entry into temples, the entire gamut of social reformations. And it just struck me, I just made one observation to them. I said, I submit to you that what I've heard in the last hour. I can cite at least one example that each of you have articulated where you have objected to something because you thought it was an imposition. So India is objecting to the Western imposition. Right? Minorities are objecting to majority imposition. Majority is objecting to being held hostage by man. Right? This, this very basic instinct that there are contexts in which I resent the fact that something is being imposed on me and I have not consented. <laughs> and I said, just extend this courtesy to every individual. <laughs> That's all that liberalism requires. <laughs> it's nothing, I mean, the, 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 you know, and, and in that sense, there are Kantians in every culture. In that sense, we actually invoke it whenever it's convenient to us, right? Right? I mean, even the whole decolonizing, I mean, the, that's the irony of the decolonizing. Its basic premise is imposition is wrong, yeah. right? So I think we have to just rewrite the histories of liberalism as emerging out of these conversations that are happening all the time, everywhere. Um, uh, the West often throws that conversation off and can close that conversation off in relation to some people. And you know, the rest of the world did as well. Uh, so in that sense, I think it, I think it is actually important. I mean, I just you know, cut this conversation short about this liberty, equality, fraternity, dignity, being this, you know, that's where exactly the one does. The second part of the question, I think, is much more, uh, you know, it is more complicated, which is in a sense, you know, what forms of social practice are both compatible with, in some sense, with this organic conversation about liberty, equality, that, you know, uh, just the mere fact of disagreement sometimes, right? which is, again, the core impulse of liberalism is if you and I disagree, right, by what presumptive right do I actually think authority will be? I mean, it's, now, it doesn't strike me that that's philosophically terribly complicated. It strikes me that that's something that arises in so many contexts, right, uh, even amongst authoritarian regimes in some ways. Uh, now, what kind of social practices, what form of legal pluralism is compatible with this basic, you know, respect for Article 14, Article 21 of the Indian Constitution? There, there can be some gray areas. There might be actually genuine disagreement where you actually think that a particular kind of practice is genuinely subordinating and preventing people from exercising their full citizenship rights. Those, that's the yardstick I would actually versus you know, activities that whose connection to people exercising their full rights as citizens and participating in the economy and politics are actually relatively peripheral or they're so distant 
um, that we are keeping the cost of imposing or, or but that's the kind of conversation I think we need to have rather than this is this Western or you know. Yeah, so thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. Um, I want to interrogate a little bit more this assumption that decolonial practices are postponed in our own moment, or you know, I, I, I sense that you get this have a, a similar analysis of the possibility of politics in our own time as David Scott. So looking back at the anti-colonial moment as a different moment as ours. But I was wondering, there's some time that has passed since Conscripts of Minority was published, and I think that there were movements that came into existence and were quite powerful. And I think that you know, I also did not quite yeah. recognize the discipline of political theory in the, the characterization of it's just a reading list of 15 books. I think things are changing in a very dynamic way. And so, for example, if we think about a place, not even just the United States, but if we think of a place like Brazil, uh, you know, it, what, what's happening in Brazilian universities, new generations of black students are in the universities, thanks to the affirmative action policies of the Brazilian <coughs> government, and there are new conversations that are happening as a result of that, a new, new scholarship that's being produced. If you look at the University of Chicago, where I'm from, uh, is you know a new a, a department was just announced yeah, like a month ago, the Department of Race, Diaspora, and Indig Indigeneity, right? And that, that department would have never come into existence had it not been for the George Floyd insurrection yeah. of two years ago, right? So there's an interplay, and we think, can think of indigenous studies and the uh, meaning of uh, Standing Rock, yeah. right? So there are these moments over the last couple of years that bring us here, and I think you know like Adam's work, for example, is in conversation with that in a way that it's not you know it's not just a past moment. It's I, I feel like there's a, a responsibility of political theorists to think about what knowledge comes out of these movements and how can the institutions that we operate in, like for example, the University of Chicago, uh, think about their colonial relations to the South Side, uh, their you know investments regarding to their endowment, uh, etc. And so I just want to hear a little bit more of yeah. what, how you would think of these kind of moment, moments of insurrection, but also sort of the durability of these institutions as they find institutional spaces, like you know, in Brazilian classrooms or institutional new departments. And how do you see that affecting the discipline of political theory? Uh, <laughs> I mean, you, 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 you actually give a very good answer to how it's going to be. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, as I and I were kind of discussing this yesterday, I think. Uh, so a couple of academic points and a couple of political points. Yes. Uh, I think on the academic points, I think there is this kind of interesting question, which is, what is the genre in which we think political theory is done? And I think it's true that, so one of the things is obstacles, right? Traditionally, was when you show me a text that looks like this, which it's not clear why it should be done, right? And and a lot of the interesting political theory in some senses, like as in that movement, as in contemporary social movements, in a sense emerges out of the practice of claim making and the practice of movements. And in some ways, one very fertile ground for good theorizing is in a sense actually to think about those. I mean, it's, you know, it's almost, if you want to kind of hear the name, it's almost a kind of new year new theory opposed to a kind of high view theory. And, and I actually think that, I mean, I actually think even these high concepts in a sense emerge out of actually exactly those, those kinds of conversations, right? Um, and and, and it's, a, it's a small parochial matter of kind of what, what's an appropriate pedagogy in a curriculum, you know, uh, uh, that actually prepares students for actually doing, in some sense, this kind of work. Uh, so that, I think, is, 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 is in a sense, is a kind of tremendous uh, thing. The second thing which, of course, you're right, never stops and has never stopped in history is, of course, this practice of claim making on behalf of liber liberation movements, right? I mean, in that sense, politics has never stopped, right? I mean, they, 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 it, it's, it's hard to imagine a time where, you know, groups, marginalized groups, or, or anyone actually just, in fact, even privileged groups, actually stop making claims of various kinds and we adjudicate them through in some sense non right? uh, So I think we just suggest that that's like all the kind of politics is, is, has stopped. And as I said, the denaturalization, for example, of all these categories is an incredible gain over what we went through the last you know, 30, 40 years. I mean, that's a, that's a very concrete manifestation, uh, which may generate its own backlash, but that's always the product of, you know, politics of revolution, counter-revolution in some senses, right? Uh, 
So I, 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 I think I'm completely, I think, with you. I, you know, I think that. Uh, oh, yeah. So, okay. Um, and so, can you hear? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so I think that I think is is is, is a. Good. But I think the political conclusion you might actually draw is is in a sense more I think contradictory, and perhaps I was in a sense more focusing partly because kind of the question was about temporality is in a sense things that are happening somewhat at a kind of systemic structural level, right? Uh, where the scale of risk, I think, that in a sense is, let's say, posed by this kind of new form of civilizational state, for example. Um, uh, perhaps that's giving me more sleepless nights than it should. And I actually think they are in a position that while they can appropriate some of the gains of this politics, they can also actually reverse them in all kinds of you know unimaginable uh, you know unimaginable ways in some senses. And those are the political movements that in most of the world just seem much more powerful in the same way. It is the paradox. Universities are more progressive in exactly the kind of ways that you are actually in some senses describing. Just at the very same moment where our democracies are probably deeper better than I mean, the last 15, 20 years. And so part of, I think, the challenge of theorizing is actually, actually, in some sense, is to, I mean, there's a simple story people say that what is the reaction to that, which I don't quite buy. I think it's more, much more complicated.